All right. Good to see everybody here uh, tonight for our mini series called Hashtag Up From the Grave. This morning we looked at the evidence for uh, the resurrection. And the old C.S. Lewis adage was Jesus is either liar, lunatic, or what? Lord. Right? He's either liar, lunatic, or Lord. Either Jesus went around and he just lied to everybody about who he was. Jesus went around and he was just a madman. Or Jesus went around and told the truth and is actually Lord. Here recently, within the last, I don't know, decade, there's been a guy by the name of Bart Ehrman, uh, who is a professor at UNC Chapel Hill. He wrote in one of his books, uh, there's another option. That Jesus doesn't necessarily have to be a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. He could simply be legend. And this is one of the classic arguments against, if I just, you know, turn the clicker on, right? Classic arguments against uh, the resurrection narrative that's shown in the Gospels. Over the last, you know, 10, 15 years, we've had the Da Vinci Code come out that talks a lot about what might have been inserted into the Gospels. Uh, maybe some embellishment, maybe some legend. This right here uh, is actually something that was seen uh, on Fox News, Freedom uh, from Religion Foundation. It says, nobody died for our sins. Jesus Christ is a myth. And maybe one of the things that you haven't heard, but an argument that's kind of making its way back into the mainstream, uh, is, this, is this argument that I just uh, heard the other day while talking to a fellow uh, Marine on Facebook. He said, isn't it interesting that there are a bunch of rising and dying gods during that time frame? And isn't it also interesting that Jesus just happens to fit in those narratives? And so the question that, that we're going to try and answer, and I hear some quotes uh, this is from the Jesus Mysteries. It says, Why should we consider the story of Osiris, Adonis, Addis, Mithras, and other pagan mystery saviors as fables, yet come across essentially the same story in a Jewish context and believe it to be a biography about a carpenter from Bethlehem? In the Da Vinci Code, the book, it says, there's nothing original within the texts of Christianity. And so the question that we're going to ask tonight, the thing we're going to look at tonight is, is that true? Is it a one-for-one -one parallel between Jesus and all of these other rising and dying gods? Because if it can be shown that Jesus is just kind of a copycat, Christianity is just kind of a copycat religion, then what basis would we have to follow it? We know for a fact that it's simply borrowed, reshuffled, uh, and regurgitated basically the same story that people have been hearing. For hundreds and hundreds of years. So, areas of consideration tonight. Was Jesus an actual historical figure? You know, there are people that walk around uh, that say Jesus wasn't even a historical figure. There's no evidence that he was a historical figure. Secondly, uh, was the resurrection account a copycat of ancient Near East or Roman religions? If Jesus was a historical figure, then he separates himself from the likes of Zeus, Hercules, Osiris, Adonis, Mithras, and every other divine God. But if he doesn't, if he is not a historical person, uh, then in all likelihood, the Jesus narrative, especially the resurrection, is a fable. I can already tell by the looks on some faces, the blood is already a little amped up. Right? Blood pressure is kind of high. But that's okay. We need to in encounter these. So, is Jesus a historical figure? The first witness we're going to call to the stand is Josephus. He was born in 37 AD to a well-respected Jewish priest uh, named Matthias. Fought against the Romans in the Jewish uprisings. Uh, later joined the Romans and worked as a historian. And mentions Jesus on two accounts in his book, in his work called Antiquities. Now... What we need to understand first is that um, in the first account, the first reference of Jesus seems to spell out and goes something like this, where Josephus says, there once was a man, if you can call him a man, his name was Jesus. He, and at the end of this text, he says, he certainly was the Christ. Now, there's a problem with that. What scholars uh, and, and uh, 
experts have noted is that Christians actually uh, went into those texts and changed it to kind of prop up uh, their case for Jesus. So in all likelihood, that first text that we find that you'll see has been manipulated. In other words, uh, Christians, some Christians did some, some not nice things uh, to the works of Josephus. But there is another reference that he gives to Jesus in the second account, and it states, uh, having such a character, uh, Ananus, uh, though uh, thought that with Festus dead, Albinius uh, still on the way, he would have the proper opportunity convening the judges of the Sanhedrin. He brought before them the brother of Jesus, who is called the Christ whose name was James, a certain and certain others. He accused them of having transgressed the law and delivered them up to be stoned. And so, in this section, Josephus notes a couple of things. One, there was an actual historical figure named Jesus. And two, he actually had a brother uh, named James, who is the same James uh, that was once uh, not a believer, but now was a believer. And notice what they say about Jesus. That James is the brother of Jesus who people call what? The Christ. And so we can establish a couple of things just from that sentence. That James, that James is a historical figure. That Jesus is a historical figure. They were related and people knew Jesus or called Jesus the chosen one. The Messiah. And that's from a Jewish source. What I would like to call a hostile source for two reasons. Number one. Most Jews at that time would not see, as we see in the Gospels, would not see that Jesus was divine. And secondly, he's working for the Romans. And so the problem with the first text uh, that isn't up on the screen is that if you're a Jew and you work for the Romans and you say that someone else is king or that someone else is chosen or someone else is God, guess what? You don't get to write history. You become history. Right? And so this is why this one seems to be more authentic than the first. So that's what Josephus says. The second witness is Tacitus, lived from 56 AD to 120 AD, and he's considered the greatest Roman historian of all time. And note uh, what he says right here. Therefore, to squelch the rumor, Nero created scapegoats and subjected to the most refined torture <laughs> whom the common people called Christians, a group hated for their abominable crimes. These, uh, their name comes from Christ, who, during the reign of Tiberius, had been executed by the procreator Pontius Pilate. Now, what we see from this, that lines up exactly with what Luke chapter 3, verse 1 through 4 notes. That in the 15th year in the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate was the procreator uh, of Judea. And suppressed for a moment, the deadly superstition broke out again. Not only in Judea, the land with uh, originated this evil, but also in the city of Rome. Most scholars say that he is alluding to this idea that Jesus had risen from the dead. So here's a Roman historian, once again, not a disciple, not within Jesus' inner circle, not uh, associated with any uh, church that's mentioned in the New Testament, but he notes that Jesus was executed in the reign of Tiberius under Pontius Pilate. Now here's the thing that we have to understand about historical events. Historical events only happen to historical figures. You ever thought about that? Historical events only happen to historical figures. So if Jesus is just a myth, then how could Jesus who is the founder of Christianity, during this time people group name of Christians get their name from this guy Christ, Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, if he's just a myth, how does all that take place? How do historical events happen to mythical people? Doesn't seem to be the case. All right, next is Lucian, uh, lived from uh, AD 115 to 200, and uh, he did a lot of satire. In other words, he made fun of a lot of people. And notice what he says. The Christians, you know, worship man to this day. 
the distinguished person who introduced their novel rights and was crucified on that account. Now, when you take Tacitus' testimony along with Lucian's statement, you can see that he's alluding to the same group of people. The same group of people <clears throat> who get their novel rights from their leader who was crucified. While he doesn't state Jesus directly, there is an indirect inference to Jesus Christ. Fourth witness is the Jewish Talmud, an ancient source of rabbinical teachings. And note what it says, on the eve of Passover, they hung Yeshua. The Greek equivalent to this is Jesus. Once again, you have rabbinical teachings that note that Jesus Christ was hung. And hung, there is a uh, connotation to crucifixion as well. So, we've got some pretty good sources on our hands. Fifth witness is Dominic Crossan. He's a textual scholar, member of the Jesus Seminar. And if you don't know anything about the Jesus Seminar, let me tell you this. They are a very, very skeptical group. And their mission was to go back through the text of the Gospels and pick out what Jesus really said, did not say in the Gospels. But note what he says. Jesus' death by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate is as sure as anything historical can ever be. For if no follower of Jesus had written anything for 100 years after his crucifixion, we would still know about it from two authors among his support among his supporters. Their names are Flavius Josephus and Cornelius Tacitus. Notice what he said right there. He said, even if we didn't have the Gospels, even if nobody within the first 100 years of Jesus' crucifixion wrote anything about it, we would still have historical grounds to show that that event actually took place. In other words, historical events happened to historical people. Also, you have a guy by the name of Bart Herman, a uh, textual uh, critic, chair of religious studies at UNC Chapel Hill, a bunch of New York Times bestsellers right there. Notice what he said. In my view, humanists, agnostics, atheists, mythicists, and anyone else who does not advocate belief in Jesus would be better served to stress that the Jesus of history is not the modern is not the Jesus of modern Christianity than to insist wrongly and counterproductively that Jesus that Jesus existed or that Jesus didn't exist, he did exist. So what's his argument? His argument is we're better served in trying to show that the Jesus of that Christianity is not the same Jesus of today, right? Rather than go around saying he didn't exist at all. Our goal should be, in other words, he's saying our goal should be to show that maybe he wasn't divine, not he didn't exist. It's counterproductive to go out saying that he did not exist. So, this is what we have so far. Roman sources that reference Jesus, Jewish sources that reference Jesus, and modern scholars critical of Jesus' messiahship note that his crucifixion was a historical event. In other words, Jesus is the first piece to our puzzle this song. Jesus is a historical figure. Whether people like it or not. The second question we're going to look at is, was the resurrection a borrowed story? Robert Price states in his book, Deconstructing Jesus, that the ancient Mediterranean world was hit deep in religion centered on the death and resurrection of Savior gods. He lists a bunch of those right there, and he says, uh, along with Jesus, are all on the same level playing field. <clears throat> so, dying and rising gods, here's some, Osiris. Now, the question that we have to ask is, are they a one-for-one -one parallel, or do they just share some similarities? See, a parallel is different than a similarity. Now, Osiris was killed by his brother, chopped into 14 pieces, and thrown into the ocean. Sound anything like the Gospels? <clears throat> no, not, not even in the slightest. And note what happens. His wife, Isis, recovers 13 uh, of the 14 pieces and rejuvenates him. The one piece that was lost, she couldn't get it back because it was swallowed by a fish. But 13, I guess, is good enough, right? 13 is good enough to rejuvenate. Mike Makona, uh, a historian, said that that is not a... Uh, resurrection, uh, that's a zombie. <laughs> so that's a zombie, right? And notice what happens. He takes position 
a prominent position in the underworld, when Jesus rose from the grave, he did not take a prominent position in the underworld. He walked the same space that he formerly occupied. That's a little bit different than being chopped up into 14 pieces. That's a little bit different than being killed by a brother. That's a little bit different than taking a prominent position in the underworld. So, parallel between Osiris and Jesus? Absolutely not. Similarities? Yes, they both died. Congratulations. Woohoo! Yep, one for one. Alright, Adonis, God of love. And the thing that we need to understand about Adonis, that he isn't connected with the resurrection until much later after Christianity was already established. So, the question is, how could uh, Christians adopt a resurrection story from Adonis when the resurrection story of Adonis isn't even written until after the close of the Gospels. The question that we want to ask is, what's more likely? The Christians copied from the Adonis story, or the Adonis story copied from the Christian story? It's hard to copy from something that's not around until after Christianity's already established. All right, Apollonius, um, we only have one source of his life. Uh, his biographer was commissioned to write a praiseworthy biography, and the project was clearly to rehabilitate his questionable reputation. Notice, he had, the person that wrote his biography had financial backing from the government that oversaw the project. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, any Romans walk up to them and say, hey, we want you to write a biography about Jesus. Make it really swell. We don't see any of that. Because what did they get for writing their biography? Like we said this morning, death, torture, and persecution. Not the case uh, with uh, Apollonius. Mithras. Now, this is probably the closest parallel we're going to get to Christianity. And note what it says here. I was believed to have two vital functions in testing of human souls, weighing good and evil effects on each human trial, and viewed as savior. Uh, Mithraism included having a sacred meal and bread on a set day, but notice it wasn't established until 150 AD after the close of the New Testament. Now, once again, what's more likely? That the people who followed after Mithra <coughs> copied from Christianity or Christianity copied from Mithraism? Probably they copied from Christianity. Martin Hengel wrote, it should be remembered that we have more detailed accounts about the real oriental mystery deities or their cults only from the 2nd and 3rd century A.D. Gospels were closed, written by the end of the 1st century. You're saying we don't have these dying and rising accounts until uh, 2nd, 3rd century A.D. One can only hope that in the end it will also come uh, to notice of New Testament exegesis so worn out cliches which suppose crude depend, uh, depends on the earliest Christianity between AD 30 and AD 50 on mysteries may be given way to a more pertinent and informed verdict. Basically what he's saying is, everybody that's saying that Christianity copied from all these deities needs to knock it off. That's essentially what he's saying. Now, another thing that we need to look at is this question. Even if you found a dying and rising God in the ancient Near East or even Roman Greek mythology that paralleled one for one with the story of Jesus, does that necessarily negate the truth of the Jesus resurrection? And here's the illustration to show that. I want you to answer this question. Who am I talking about? Son of a congressman, ran for office during a time of civil unrest, was assassinated by a lone gunman, conflicting reports about where the bullet came from. Culprit died soon after the assassination. He was succeeded by a man with the last name Johnson. Who am I talking about? Kennedy? Kennedy? How about Abe Lincoln? Now, the question that I have is, does anything about the assassination of Lincoln <coughs> undercut the truth of the Kennedy assassination despite the similarities? Absolutely not. Not even close. I have to take those on a case-by-case -case basis. So even if you have Osiris 
who, by the way, is not a historical figure, even if you had a guy named Osiris and he paralleled the same uh, account of Jesus, guess what? Just because that takes place doesn't do anything to the truth claimed or the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Here's another one. What am I talking about? There was once a ship that was deemed unsinkable. It was the largest ship in history at the time. On its maiden voyage, it hit an iceberg and sank. The majority of men died and a few women survived. What am I talking about? Titanic. Titanic? How about the wreck of the Titan? That was written 14 years before the Titanic ever left shore. Does this fiction have anything to do or negate the truth of the story of the Titanic? Absolutely not. So even if there are parallels, which there aren't, it does nothing to negate the truth claim of Christianity. It does nothing to undercut the resurrection of Jesus and that account. What the skeptic has to show is number one, that there is a one-for-one -one parallel, and then two, they have to prove that the writers of the New Testament borrowed from it and copied it and put it into circulation, which they cannot substantiate at all. T. D. Mettinger said, there is, as, as far as I'm aware, no evidence that the death and resurrection of Jesus is a mythological construct drawn on myths and rites of the dying and rising gods of the surrounding world. While studies with profit against the background of Jewish resurrection belief, the faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus retains its unique character in the history of religions. What does that mean? That the resurrection account and the resurrection story throughout all of history and throughout all of religions is sincerely unique. So what does that mean for you and me? That means for you and me that we don't have to worry about dying and rising gods and, and superstitious connections to all of these other Near East ancient religions. But also it means that Jesus was a historical figure. That the resurrection is unique. But also with the evidence this morning, the resurrection is true. Here's the thing. I'm preaching to the choir tonight. What are we going to do with those facts? Are we going to sit on the talent that God has given us? Are we going to sit on the treasure that God's given us in salvation that's found on the basis of life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Who are we going to open our mouths to? So that people might know that what is in the story of Jesus isn't some myth. But it's a love letter from God to people. And that God, no matter what situation people find themselves in, no matter what circumstance they find themselves in, no matter how bad they think they are, God loves them enough to die for them. That's the message that we need to get out. And this is how we can properly prepare for the arguments that will be coming. I hope uh, today, or at least tonight, that you've learned something new and that you've put something in your tool belt. And I hope tomorrow you talk to somebody about what we You have a need tonight. Maybe your faith has been shaken. Maybe things haven't been going your way. Maybe you feel distant from God. The resurrection of the cross shows how far God is willing to go to connect to you and me. You need to respond to that invitation tonight. Do so as we stand, as we stand.